Hi YouTube, this is one of a series of videos looking at the documentary A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon, produced by Bart Sabrell. You will hear me mention him quite a lot. Check out my channel for other videos in the series, or for the box set where you can watch them all in one feature length video. Part 8 The Smoking Gun now it's time to address the notorious so-called smoking gun footage, which Sabrell claims shows the crew of Apollo 11 faking their mission. There are just two pieces of footage used, although we will be told there are several more. In this part we will deal with the first of these, an unscheduled TV transmission made 10 hours into the mission. Unlike the previous parts of this video, I won't identify a list of claims this time, Instead, I will address the claims about the footage step by step. And finally, the element that seals their fate. Of all the footage of Apollo 11 requested from NASA over a five-year period, one gem was discovered just before the completion of this documentary. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Neil Armstrong staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living colour with exceptionally clear behind the scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. It cannot be misconstrued that this staging was done for some other reason prior to the mission, for the reel itself is slated and dated July 18th, 19th and 20th, 1969, the very days of the mission when they were said to be approaching and achieving lunar orbit. Furthermore, it is apparent they are in genuine zero gravity aboard the actual spacecraft, necessary to convince the mass media of their authenticity, just not any further than Earth orbit, as you will see. In this never-before-seen or heard footage, not only is the radio conversation between the astronauts and Houston Control audible, there is a secondary, private conversation taking place between the crew and a third confidential party, prompting the astronauts with what to say, when to speak, and how to effectively manipulate the camera to achieve the desired misleading effect. NASA claims that the Houston transmissions were the only ones taking place with the astronauts. Listen now as Houston Control initiates a conversation with the crew, only to find them too preoccupied with the behind-the-scenes trickery to respond. Moments pass and the oversight is picked up on by the clandestine third party who quickly prompts them with talk. Immediately, Neil Armstrong speaks. Hello, Apollo 11. Houston Goldstone says that the TV looks so great. Over. The first clip comes from an unscheduled TV transmission known as GET 1032. GET stands for Ground Elapsed Time, in this case 10 hours and 32 minutes after launch. At this time the spacecraft was about 50,000 miles from Earth. The crew had just finished a course correction procedure and were planning on putting the spacecraft into Passive Thermal Control Mode, or PTC a slow rotation to keep temperatures balanced around the craft. The crew shot these photos of Earth while the PTC data was being uploaded to the flight computer from Mission Control. When this was completed, they were given the go-ahead to start the PTC, but Armstrong suggested a delay. I have removed a few gaps between the communications here in the interests of brevity. Hello Apollo 11 Houston, your rates look really great now, you can start your PTC. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Houston, you're at 11. Roger, go ahead, 11, over. Roger, uh, if you'd like to delay uh, PTC entrance for uh, 10 minutes or so, we can uh, shoot you some uh, TV of a 7 8 Earth. Uh, that, we'll leave that up to you. Roger, stand by. Hello, 
Apollo 11, Houston, we'll have an answer for you on the TV in about one minute, over. Houston, uh, we're ready at uh, Goldstone for the TV. It'll be recorded at Goldstone and then replayed back over here. Neil, anytime you want to turn it on, we're ready, over. Okay, it'll take us about five minutes to get the rig. Roger. So it was decided to broadcast footage of the Earth before starting the PTC, when the rotating spacecraft would make this difficult. Flight controller Charlie Duke then advises the crew the broadcast will be recorded and played back later. So the crew and the watching press now know that there is to be a TV transmission and that the entire thing will be recorded and played back later. So the idea that the crew or anyone else believed any part of this transmission was behind the scenes is obvious nonsense. Likewise, the claim that this footage is never before seen or heard is also untrue. Six minutes later, Armstrong is ready to start the transmission. Okay, uh, Houston, we are uh, sending a picture of Earth down right now, uh, so you can uh, uh, let us know if they're receiving it, Goldstone. Roger, 11. Goldstone is receiving the TV. Stand by, we'll let you know on the quality, over. Then the TV transmission begins, and we hear what we are told is a clandestine third party giving stage directions. Hello, Apollo 11. Houston, Goldstone says that the TV looks great, over. Okay, uh, Roger, we're... Uh... Let's listen to that a couple more times. It's very difficult to tell quite what is being said here. Once we are told it is the word talk, it sounds like that. But it really isn't that clear. Throughout the Apollo missions, there are hundreds of examples of similar unidentified radio traffic. But from this single word, if it is a word... Sabrell has inferred a director and actors. Why would this clandestine third party feel the need to prompt the astronauts at this point? There are pauses in communications between ground and crew all the time, sometimes minutes long. And yet we are supposed to believe that the moment this secret director knew that a recording was being made that would be played back and broadcast, he was so incensed by a few seconds of dead air that he decided to speak on a channel that was broadcast to press and public and risk exposing the entire hoax. And why would such a person even have this functionality available to them? We are also told that this failure to respond occurs because the crew are preoccupied with setting up the hoax and have forgotten that they are broadcasting. And yet this is only 80 seconds after Armstrong announced that he had started transmitting. OK, back to the film. Again, the illusion they are attempting to create is the Earth at a distance to demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. Understand, too, that only about 20 seconds of this raw footage was ever broadcast to the public, and these conversations discussing their deception were believed to be private. Until now. Here they discuss that these television transmissions were in fact not broadcast live as everyone believed. They were first screened and edited for playback later. Hi, uh, Roger, Neil. We just wanted a narrative such a weekend when we get the playback, we can sort of correlate what we're saying. Thank you very much. There is no evidence for this 20-second claim. There were hundreds of people working at Goldstone where the transmission was received. All of the voice transmission went out live to the press in mission control. There would never be any reason for any astronaut to believe anything they were broadcasting, voice or video, was private in any way. Similarly, no one believed that the transmissions were live. We heard Charlie Duke tell the crew and the press and public the opposite. Houston, uh, we're ready at uh, Goldstone for the TV. It'll be recorded at Goldstone and then replayed back over here. Neil, any time you want to turn it on, we're ready, over. Mr. Sabral is creating a story here of secret conversations and deception over live and recorded TV that simply did not exist. Let's hear this exchange about the TV transmission from a little earlier in the recording. Hello, Apollo 11. Houston, we'd like you to uh, keep the TV 
TV on for about uh, 10 minutes or so, so we can get some uh, good comparison on the camera. You can uh, do anything you're... So Mission Controller Charlie Duke is asking the crew to test drive the TV camera and provide narration so when they watch back later they know what they are seeing. The voice communications are poor at this time so he repeats this request a few times. Apollo 11 Houston will try once more on this uh, TV request. We'd like 10 minutes worth of TV and we'd like a narrative if you could give us one on the exterior shot. You could, uh, we also suggest you might try the an interior position over. Uh, Roger, uh, we're seeing uh, the uh, center of the uh, Earth as viewed from the spacecraft in uh, the uh, eastern Pacific Ocean. We have not been able to visually pick up the uh, Hawaiian Island chain, but we can clearly see the western coast of North America, uh, the United States, the San Joaquin Valley, the, the uh, High Sierras, uh, Baja California and Mexico down uh, as far as Acapulco and uh, the Yucatan Peninsula and you can see on through Central America to the uh, northern coast of South America, Venezuela and Colombia. I'm not sure you'll be able to see all that uh, on uh, your screens down there. Hi, uh, Roger, Neil. We just wanted a narrative such a weekend when we get to playback, we can sort of correlate what we're saying. Thank you very much. Again, there is absolutely nothing private about this. Thousands of people heard this exchange as it happened. And what we heard was a perfectly natural exchange between Mission Control and the crew, working to get the best possible TV picture. There is nothing unusual or clandestine about this. All of the video is readily available, as are the voice recordings and transcripts. OK, give your eyes a rub, because we are about to start seeing things. Oh, and hearing things. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the spacecraft through the other windows, as to not cause any reflected light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. OK, very good. Well, we shut out the sun coming in some of the other windows into the spacecraft, so... Uh... Looking through a uh, the uh, number one window, and there isn't any uh, reflected light. Before we go any further with this part, let's get some context for what Aldrin just said. Here is the conversation from the original recording. Okay, my comments were my comments were from Ghost on that the they see no white spots uh, as we saw in ten. Looks like the AGC is working real well. The F twenty two looks good. Over. Okay, very good. Well, we. Shut out the sun coming in some of the other windows into the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a uh, the uh, number one window, and there isn't any uh, reflected light right now, so it ought to be a pretty good picture. Roger. Mission controller Charlie Duke is talking about some white spots that appeared on the TV picture from Apollo 10. Aldrin responds by reassuring him that they have blocked out as much light as they can to prevent reflections off the windows. Something we have all done when trying to view a dark outside from a light inside, or vice versa. Aldrin doesn't mention the walls at all, even though Sibrel includes this in the transcript as if he did. OK, so why does Sibrel say they need to stop light reflections from the walls? The reason this was done is so that the truth of the matter would not be revealed. It is this. Though the federal government would have you believe that this is a view of Earth from a distance out of the spacecraft's window as it nears the moon, it is not. What they have ingeniously done is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground, outside of which it is completely filled with the Earth in low orbit. The circumference of the window then appears to be the diameter of the Earth at a distance, with the darkened walls of the spacecraft appearing to be the blackness of space around it. That is why they wanted the interior dark and blocked out the sun from entering through the other windows. There are a number of significant problems with this idea. Firstly, this is what the Earth looks like from a spacecraft in low Earth orbit. If we add in a spacecraft and window and black out the interior lights, 
this is what we get. The earth apparently rolling by the window like a conveyor belt. Nothing like what we see in the TV transmission. So we know this assertion cannot possibly be true. Secondly, Aldrin has just told us he is shooting through the number one window, which is trapezoidal in shape and not circular. The main hatch window was circular, but only on the inside. The outside of it was a rounded rectangle. This detail becomes important when we hear what is proposed next. Here you can see the extruded window, probably two inches thick at the bottom. This is because the earth shine is coming in at a downward angle. It also causes the earth to appear to be an irregularly shaped circle, for you are seeing the outside of the window at the bottom and the inside of the window at the top, which together form two different sized halves of a circle. Subsequently, this take was never used. We know that again this cannot be true, because there were no circular outside windows. It gets worse though. See why in part 9, The Smoking Gun 2. Thanks for watching. Please rate, comment and subscribe.